Inside Racing pays tribute to George Moore, who died in Sydney recently, aged 84. This time we present part two of a special interview recorded with the legendary jockey on the Gold Coast in 2002. Last week, George Moore took us from childhood days in Mackay to his successful apprenticeship in Brisbane when army service restricted him to Saturday racing only. He spoke of Cordale, the horse to launch his Sydney career and his sometimes stormy relationship with TJ Smith. When I come in, he blew up and, and screamed out, what are you so-and-so doing? And yeah. Anyway, I told him what to do with himself and I said, ride the rest for, for the day yourself. He lifted the lid on some of the jockeys of the 1940s who fancied a tipple between races. But uh, they were all pretty plastered by the end of the day, both of them. He spoke of the Flying East Affair in 1953, which triggered his three-year disqualification. Then all hell broke loose. Everybody was going on crazy. The Moors fixed the race. And what? In this episode, George recalls that during his time out, many of his so-called friends disappeared. They all disappeared by about four. And that when you came back, you were a different George Moore. That's From right. that moment on, it was G. Moore number one and friends number two. Is that, is that story true? Uh, it would be 90% true. You came yes. back a little bitter. I was, yeah, because really, OK, that, I could have got sent out, but give me three years was a bit over the, the odds sort of thing. So anyhow, I made up my mind when I came back I was going to be champion jockey. So, but the thing was getting a ride the first day. But I had two or three people rang up and wanted to rip me on. And TJ rang and he said, uh, you want to ride a winner? I said, yeah. He said, oh, H, Harry Darwin. He's got a thing it'll win, but he's got no money. I said, oh, no, not already, straight away. Oh, <laughs> hey, he's got to pay for, pay for ride these things. Yeah. Again. So I rang John Rogan. I, he said, yeah, I'll put 200 on it for you. So at that time, TJ hadn't given me a ride. He hadn't put me down for anything. So I said, what am I right? He said, oh, you know, well, you, know, you start to stutter and stumble. And yeah. Anyway, they must have got on his back, a few of the boys, and they said, hey, you've got to give him a ride, you know. Tommy Kennedy gave me a ride, and I forget about a couple of other people. Yeah. And uh, so t he had a horse in the last, uh, what was his name again? Uh, anyhow, Selwood was riding, so he pulled Selwood off. Old Mr Moon to be at, uh, owned it. And uh, so right out. I won on the old stick at Darwin's, it won. And come to the last, and I, I won the last. I got up and won the last, and I was a off double running. Double first day back. Yeah, I was yeah. up and running. Your relationship with a bloke called George Mully yep. was a well-documented one. Yeah. Now, before we talk about the tensions between you two, let's talk about how you felt about him as a jockey. Now, old-timers tell me that you had more respect for Mully than you had for most jockeys. I think he was probably the best of my time if you could keep him on the ball, you know, because he was a, a bit of a wanderer and that sort of thing, but he was a fantastic jockey. He was the right weight. He could ride anything, anyway. But he and I, we locked horns a bit, but that's natural, you know, the opposition. Was he a bit of a stirrer? Oh, well, he liked to try that sort of stuff, yes, to a degree. But uh, we had a bit of a punch up at Canterbury one day over, over the lockers. It was all caused by, uh, when I came back, I wasn't sure I was going to uh, stay home, and uh, I just used uh, one locker and hung up my clothes on the wall. But as before that, I'd have uh, three lockers, and he had my lockers. So when I decided to stay, I said to him, I want one of my lockers back, and he, he said, you can't have them. I said, I'm... So I got his clothes, I just shoved them in his face, and one thing led to another, and next thing well, there was blow struck. Who threw the first one? I don't remember, <laughs> but I wasn't going to be the last one, I can tell you that now. <laughs> so uh, they separated us, and after the last, I, I was really hot under the collar, because he had a go at me through one of the races. So I walked around and just hit him in the mouth. I said, here, now have a go now, and I belted him straight in the mouth. So we got stuck into it again. They yeah. broke it up. That had it been that. allowed to continue, do you think it would have been a clear points decision? Well, I don't know. I was going to give him a chance to find out if it was going to be points. I wanted a knockout. <laughs> 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 now you've been late. Yeah. Anyhow, we both got fined and they put Mully on one side of the jockey's room and me on the other. Mate, there have been a few bones broken in that body over mm. a long period of years. 
uh, you had your share of falls, one very, very nasty one. I'll never forget it, as you won't. I can still see it happening. It was a seven and a half furlong race at Canterbury Park. Yeah. You rode a horse called Will Sight, yep. and he literally went a hundred yards and headed for the outside fence. Yeah. Well, he'd been trained at Canterbury before TJ got him. And I didn't know, nobody told me about him, that he'd be jumping the fence there and he'd run out the gap and all sorts of things. But that day, you know, I just got over a bad fall and uh, I wasn't feeling all that crash hot. So anyhow, he just went out and bang straight over the outside fence. So, uh, Did I, you land on a concrete slab? Uh, no, it threw me into a mentioned? brick wall actually. Did he? Brick wall. Ray Stokely tells the best one, after we went about half full, he went away, he said, hey, have a look at more, see where he's going, Ray said. Yeah. He told me this himself. Anyway, straight over the fence, and I, I don't remember him, uh, I remember him going over, but I don't remember anything very much else. I did come conscious in the ambulance, and Iris took me, and this day they took me to Canterbury, and they took me back, the, I had to get another ambulance, took me back to St Vincent's Private, and then I went into a, uh, not a deep coma, but I went into a, a sort of a coma till the a following mild Wednesday. Mild one for a mild, few days. Yeah, till the mm. Wednesday, and the two doctors were standing there, whether they were going to do something or other, and I come, come around. So... Uh, what was the injury list? Uh, collarbone, five ribs, broken pelvis, three fingers, you name it. I don't think it didn't get a doctor out of my stupid old head. I said, <laughs> George, what age would have you been at this particular time? Around the 40 mark? Yeah, I'd be in the 40s, well in the 40s, yeah. yes. I didn't ride much longer after that. I, I came back and rode and then I retired. I went down to Jugion and then Daisy Tate got hold of me and finished up, told me they had to ride Baguette, that nobody could ride Baguette like me. Well, that was happening. He wasn't winning anything. No. So I made a comeback. And he was my first ride back. Nice horse to come back for. Uh, well, at that time he wasn't, because everybody had had a crack at him. Mm. And Higgins, he gave me the, the heave-ho. He said, uh, the words he said to me, he said, uh, he said, he's a so-and-so, he will so-and-so try you out. I said, I'll ride Baguette my way. Mm. And it was the new market, actually. And I jumped him out, he spat the bit out, back to last. I pulled him out about a foot and a half out and he just blitzed him. I said to Higgins, oh yeah, he didn't know how to ride him. That's the way to ride him. You're riding, he's a mood horse. Yeah. Another day he jumped and wanted to run, you know. But in the Newman 10,000, where was he yeah. running? Tail off last. Uh, George, do you know his sire, Rigo, mm -hmm. was exactly the same. Was he? Eh? A mood horse. Oh, he was a mood horse. Exactly the same. But I got a month's worst part of it was mm. a bloke got left at the barrier when I got back to last and I said, I'll go over to the fence. The next thing I go, oi, 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 oi. Well, look, there's a bloke got left. I've knocked him down. Oh, this is great. So coming up to the home turn, I've come right into the race. And a bloke tried to get up inside of me and I just shoved him back. So anyway, one. Stewart's Inquiry, big at Stewart's Inquiry, every, jo <laughs> every jockey in the race was in the room, mm. and I was one, you know, I think the three place to us, all the jockeys got suspended, I was first, I forget who was second, I forget who was third. Mm. So Clive Morgan, I rode a lot of winners for him when he was a trainer, mm. and I said to Mr Morgan, listen, I haven't got eyes in the back of my head, I said, hey, how can I be had up for knocking a bloke down when I'm running last? I said, I didn't know as a bloke got left at the barrier. He said, yes, George, but I'll get you for the home turn if I don't get you there. So, yeah, yeah. so I was gone. Now, Baguette was a very important horse in your career. Mm. It took you a long time to win a golden slipper. Mm. You must have been thinking you were never going to crack the slipper hoodoo. But in 1970, you did. You won the slipper on this little brown colt. And you had to give Kay Langby a decent old shunt to get out at the top of the straight. Uh, well, that's why the protest wasn't upheld and why uh, I never got suspended. Actually, it was caused by the Melbourne horses, when they turned for home, they sort of veered away from the inside. And as they veered away, I veered with them and I knocked Langby down. Yeah, looked bad from the stand. Well, I'll tell you what, it was, the protest was dismissed and I never got suspended. So. It must have been what my evidence was that I didn't want to go out there. I got pushed out there by the two Melbourne horses, which they, when you looked at it, I did see it here somewhere one day, I was playing it, and it's quite obvious what happened was they shifted and pushed me towards Langby and I, I knocked him down. Yeah. So that was that. But TJ wasn't happy. He was going around, oh, he was really bellowing for about three weeks. Yeah. 
Of course, his name was Royal Show. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, oh, yeah. did he? What? Gee whiz. Now, he won the slipper again the following year. Yeah, pretty ordinary on a horse. Philly Fairy Walk in an yeah. ordinary slipper. Yeah, wasn't it was ordinary. She was ordinary mare. Yeah. She just failed with, failed being good. She was just below good. You follow what I mean? Yeah. But uh, that, that was luck. George was blessed with the opportunity to ride great horses all over the world. But when it comes to nominating the best, he unhesitatingly nominates Tullock. We'll come back after this break and hear George's tribute to the great champion. George, only true champions can do what Tullock did. He raced uh, precociously as a two-year-old, and he was still winning races five years later, like the two-mile Brisbane mm -hmm. Cup, with a life-threatening illness in between times. Now, you can't be much more precocious than to run in the Breeders' Plate. And you rode him in the Breeders' Plate. He ran second. That's right. Then he came out and won the Canterbury. He suddenly, he says, run around, I'll run him on Wednesday now too. I said, oh, Jesus. Yeah. Anyway, he won that. Then he put him on the plane, or the train, sent him to, or the plane, wherever it was, I said, sent him to Melbourne. And he won at Caulfield. And then he, uh, I, what, I, I run him in the one down the straight at Flemington, the big two rail race. Mary uh, Malone? Yep. And that good filly uh, of McCartan's beat him. And he said, I got suspended. He said, oh, I'm going to run him on Saturday again. And he won that. Ward ran him, he won that thing. And then he said, oh, I'm going to send him to Brisbane. I said, oh, Christ, what sort of horse is this? One morning he said to me, get on uh, Tullick and let him go half a mile with Dubbo. With Dubbo? Dubbo. With Dubbo. Dubbo's just okay. won Australasian record in the Oakley Plate. A flying machine. And the new market. Mm. You know what? Australasian yeah. record. I said, you've got to be bloody silly. He said, well, don't ride him. You, you get, get on. Get on. I did. You think well, he could have won the gallop. Tullick. Uh, Tullick. Could have beat. I know I waited for him. Mm. But what's he got? Ballast. He, he, yeah. The new market with it. That's the sort of horse he was. Yeah. Tell me about the AJC Sires Produce Stakes. He was six to one against. Mm -hmm. Todman was six to one on. Yep. Seven furlongs. Yep. What happened? He, he had the wood on Todman. Well, that was my idea how to ride him. I said to TJ, I can beat this horse today. He said, nah, I don't mean I said, I can beat him. He said, how? I said, I'm going to stride with him. And I know how he strode with other horses in their work, like Oakley Plate or Secret Stride with half a mile, you know. So I knew Silver would go to the front and lead, but pull up, and I went up head and head with him. We went head and head. He got to about just over the rise, way he went Tullick. Yeah. And he won. Now in the shorter race, a few days later, the yep. Champagne Stakes, yep. which was then six furlongs. And I said he'd win that too. But he killed me. That's right, the boot was on the other foot. He killed me, he went out of the gate. Annihilated. No, he went out of the gate and let him run. In size, he came back. Mm. Within the, he let him really run. He ran Tully. Tully couldn't keep up. No. He beat me six or eight legs. What about the AJC Derby, which he won by a huge margin, mm -hmm. breaking far laps race record? No. It wasn't any How reason. did he feel that day? Well, Tully, he never had sort of bad feeling days, you know. He either went out and raced terrific or he, or he wasn't racing, sort of thing. Yeah. He enjoyed it, I think. I don't know. Tullock is increasing his lead with every stride and Tullock is going to run out an easy win in the AJC Derby and obviously makes very fast time. Was he a kind horse in a race, George? Could yep. you fire him out of the gate and say, woo, and he'd come back to you? Yeah, he didn't pull anything. Didn't yeah. pull. He's no problem. It was an easy, a very easy horse to ride. There was no, uh, well, as you say, pulling. He never, he never even thought of pulling in a race. That was, that was the sort of horse he was. Now, they tell me his temperament Shocking. At, at home was shocking. He wouldn't have kept a second wife. He wouldn't have got a first one, I don't think. Is that right? He was a nasty oh, horse, wasn't he? Oh, shocking. Well, he, we, we were training at, at, uh, behind the grandstand. Tommy had boxes over there. They, they wouldn't let him on a half mile, so we were training over there part of the time. And he and 
with another one of horse, another horse got loose one morning and they went down Allison Road at 8 o'clock or 7.30 in the morning. The policeman used to stand down there and direct traffic in the old days near Moore Park there. They went straight through all the traffic. They went into Moore Park. And then, you know, the only horse that got hurt was Plymouth. So we said straight away, that goat is no good. And it was Tully. Yeah. Because usually the good ones That's get the right. injury, don't they? Yeah. yeah. But, but I, they tell me the old policeman nearly fainted with two horses galloping. But to saddle him up when he was a young horse, he used to pig up against the... He'd be saddling him up and he'd get you like this up against the, 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 the stall. He had all sorts of tricks. I think he, he might have been a potty because he had all, he, even at the sales. They, he the, was used to having his own way. Yeah, well, at the sales, they, they, the scrappers, they all said, don't go near him. He's yeah. a bloody awful horse. Now, the story is, is well documented uh, that Tullock was near death and it was an absolute freak of nature and a tribute to the genius of Per Sykes that he came back. You rode Tullock at his last race start, one of the most emotional days I'll bet you ever spent on an Australian racetrack, the 1961 Brisbane Cup, mm -hmm. when he turned the tables on Sharpley, which had beaten him in the Sydney Cup. Now, why did Sharpley beat him in the Sydney Cup? Was it the way it was run? My mistake. I made a mistake. Now, can I just get you to repeat that? Yeah, I made a mistake. I never, I, I didn't think, uh, that Sharpley would kick as well as he did, you know, and I was sort of big weight, you know, when you get up 10 stone on horses, you're trying to make it as easy as you can, and he ducked on me, and I couldn't sort of wind old Tully up, but the worst part of it was, I was tracking Tommy Hill, I think it was, in the race, and I thought he'd take me right into the home turn, and he dropped dead, he saw us, like he fell out of the race at about the five, and I'm stuck, and I've had to come out and get around him and take off a long way out where I thought Tommy Hill's horse would carry me up. Mm. Instead of that, I had to go out and do the donkey work and do it quickly with the big weight. Mm. And then when I sort of coming to the, the dip, I just eased a little and he sort of relaxed with me mm. a length. And I, that's how he beat me three quarters of that. You never like to ride horses up that rise at random. I like to you? run off it. I like to run off it, not up it. Yeah, well, you turn that into an art form. Yeah. But they, these guys, I don't know. I don't think I know where, the, where it is anyhow. You'd cuddle up the rise, wouldn't you? Yep. And kick when you got to the yeah, top. Yeah, but I'd like, I like to go off it, out, if I could. Yeah. But not straight up, on the inside if you're there, you had to, you know, yeah. you had no option, but I would wait to get over it. We go to the Brisbane Cup of that same year. I had the double going for a good bit of money because I backed the first leg and I had the double going for good money. And, uh, now, George, you've just made the admission for the first time in this interview yeah. that you were a punter. I was a punter, yeah. Now, it's well known then and now that jockeys shouldn't be betting. Were T you always a punter? Yeah, TJ said they should all bet, make them ride better. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was always a punter. Yeah. You loved a bet? Yep. Well, it was one way to make money, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I, I well, I won, the, I won the first leg, and I took the double, and then uh, I rang a friend of mine. And I said, oh, I got this double gold for X amount, which was quite a big bit of money, and I said, uh, would you get me uh, so much out of Tullick? You follow me? Of course, somebody must have told TJ, and he rang me up, he said, you're not going to try on it. I said, Lord, bloody hell, I'm not. I got the, this double gun. <laughs> so, was Persian Lyric the other one? That's it. And you know, I... Persian had, Lyric won the strat break. You got right along the fence. Yep. I'm following Shuey. And Shuey is, well, he's breaking a couple of rules here and there as he went by. He either pushed him one way, he pushed him the other way, and I'm right behind him following. So anyway, Shuey's got the run coming to the turn, I've got the run, and... 
way we went. They all went. He actually took about four blokes bush to get out himself. He took three with him. I just went straight through the race. Sure, he unwittingly helped you. Yeah, he did. He, yeah. he won me the race. All right, on to the Brisbane Cup, and the pace was genuine in the Brisbane Cup. Oh, it had to be. It had to be. Because I think Tommy Smith might have had a lightly weighted horse in the race that led. Yeah, and I made sure he ran too. I offered to pay up for him even if TJ was going to scratch him. I think Ray Selkirk might, might have ridden that one. Uh, no, it wasn't Ray. Uh, who rode it? A bloke I could talk to anyhow and tell him what to do. <laughs> you yeah. say Tullock was past it. Yeah, he was. So his great big heart is the only thing that yeah. got him home. Did you feel him dying underneath you the last bit? No, the last 50 yards when he woke up, he had him beat, he took off. Did he? Yeah, you look at it closely, you'll see, choo, he went away. Yeah. But he got sick of getting hammered, you know. Yeah. Yeah, George, wins? coming back to scale that day, the yeah. crowd went berserk. Yeah. It has been said that TJ had a tear in his eye. Yeah, it wouldn't be the first time, I suppose, though. Yeah. What were your feelings for Tullock as you rode him back in that day? You must have had immense admiration for him. I did, I thought he was... Look, I rode all over the world. I mean, he was the best horse I ever put my leg on. He, he, and not by a little bit, by a big bit. Yeah. And I rode some of the champions in, in, in England and in France. So, but uh, the thing about Tullock, he was like a, a, a naughty rogue, you know? Mm. Um, no, I don't know what the right word for that is, but he, he, he could be so great that he could be such a... A likeable rogue. Yeah, he was a likeable rogue, yeah. Yeah. But he, he, he just could do things to you and you couldn't believe it. That's it. George, you talk about doubles, major yeah. race doubles. Mm. Now, I can remember you winning a big autumn double at Randwick, Doncaster Cup. Mm. And you won the first leg on a Victorian mare called Cetia. She was a three-year-old filly. Yeah. She came out of 20 alley. It was a great ride and a great win. I have never seen you as happy coming back to scale on a big race winner. Although you might have been a shade happier a few days later when Prince Grant won the Sydney Cup. Now I'm only guessing, did you have that double going for something nice? Yes. Thought you might have. But I backed her too. You were doing Catherine wheels. I backed her too, but how I, you know, I when she drew the bad alley and, and, and Dick rode and I rang, or he rang me and said, hey, that, you, you're going to ride this thing? I said, yeah. He said, oh good. He said, it just run a gallop, it is. Uh, after breakfast it was, you yeah, didn't put me on it, old Bill. And he said, she's just run a gallop, it'll win anything. I said, oh, great. So I backed to each way, well, each way, took each yeah. way, and the double. And of course she got a price from 20, but you know, I went out of the gate, I went out of half a length in front. You know, not like these jockeys, most of them, you know, they go th out three quarters of a length behind when they don't want to lead. They missed the start, but I crashed out of it and I was over the first hundred yards, yeah. without touching anybody, you know. But she's a good man, very good man. Prince Grant was a tough campaigner, he was yeah, a derby winner, he was a he bad went horse. on and on like he old was man a, river. He was honest, he tried his heart out, he's a lovely old horse. But, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't look like a good horse, but he was a good horse. Yeah. When you put the pressure to him, he used to try. When George took up a lucrative English retainer in 1967, he followed in the footsteps of some great Australian jockeys. Togo Johnston, Edgar Britt, Scobie Breezley, Bill Cook and Neville Selwood had all excelled in the tough English arena. It was a fiercely determined moor who set out to prove himself the best of all. Join us for part three of the George Moore story next time on Inside Racing.